saying, eat of the good things we have provided for your sustenance, but commit no excess therein, lest my wrath should justly descend on you, and those of whom descends my wrath do perish indeed. So this is a very stern warning for Allah Allah to highlight that we need to eat what he has provided, but not to commit excess. And Allah warns the consequence, lest my wrath should descend on you. And if you're looking at the issue of being overweight and obese, obese uh, it's very clear from scientific literature that obesity and being overweight is associated with diabetes, type 2, hypertension, cardiovascular diseases, cancers, stroke, etc. And there's numerous consequences to these conditions. For example, uh, usually a person with a stroke and the disability that's uh, related to that, people with heart failure, uh, kidney disease, etc. So these really not only affect the length of a person's life, but also the quality of their life. And this is a sort of a natural consequence of our wrongful behavior that Allah Muhammad Allah warns us in this ayah. So fundamentally when we're looking at our dietary aspects, 
Uh, Allah warns us here fairly clearly and warns us that this is essentially a self-inflicted harm uh, when we do not control what we eat. A switch could be better derived out of this example. And if you look at the story in Surah uh, Hajj, Allah SWT talks of, you know, Hajj is very commonly associated with a sacrifice uh, where people slaughter their animals. Allah advises in that situation, eat you thereof and feed such as beg not, uh, but live in contentment and such as beg with due humility. Thus have we made animals subject to you that you may be grateful. So, you know, this principle of sharing is caring. Uh, it probably is caring for our own selves because when we share, we actually have less to eat and less consequences of overeating as such. So the principle of what we eat, the quantity that we eat, we should bear in mind that we need to limit what we eat. And the second dimension is that we should always make sure that what we have, we should share with others. And Allah SWT defines this act of eating of animals as an act that we should show gratitude through and also by sharing with others, it's an example of showing gratitude. So I think the principle that highlights here is that eat less and give more. And that is really principally how we should view food and diet as such. There's a very beautiful example of uh, eating behavior in the Quran. Uh, and then it's Surah Muhammad, for people who would like to uh, reference it, Surah Muhammad verse 12. Well, that's what I describe is a great blessing for the righteous people. And Allah describes, well, those yeah, furuna. And the word kufr could be translated as disbelief, but also those who are ungrateful as well. And Allah says, those who have furuna will enjoy this world and eat as cattle eat, and the fire will be their own. And I think this is a very important reminder to all of us that when we look at our daily meals, do we eat like cattle? You, know, you just come, it's the food on the table, you swallow, and you move on to the next thing. And it loses the dimension of appreciation on one hand, and also removes that, that concept of awareness when we pray before we eat. It is appreciation and recognition of the food in front of us. Uh, and also appreciation and recognition that Allah has warned us about excessive eating. It warned us and advised us about sharing as such. So, so these are dimensions around uh, the questions around obesity and being overweight, which is very common in South Africa and also around our Muslim community as well. And there are obviously consequences around that. So the principle is basically, we should be very cautious of what we eat, try and eat a limited diet. Uh, and I think what's very important about the principle of eating is really, you're supposed to eat your, according to your requirements. When you're hungry, you eat. So this brings me to another dimension around uh, restrictive eating. So we're very familiar with fasting in Ramadan, so you restrict your diet, and then you sort of go crazy after the salad goes, right? You just eat it, eat it, eat. And it sort of defies the purpose of what the restrictive diet was for Ramadan. But what's also important to appreciate is that globally now, there's a new trend about intermittent fasting. I don't think people have seen this on the internet, but you go to Europe, I mean, every second person is doing intermittent fasting. And it seemed to be a, a very important way of reducing weight. Uh, principally, it's based around the concept that uh, you need to fast for at least 12 to 14 hours at a minimum. And some people go on about 36 hours with just water in between. And the principle behind this intermittent fasting is based on the principle that you know, we eat and it provides energy for our body's needs. But whatever is excessive and unnecessary at that point in time, the body stores it in fat, it stores it in glycogen, but at other sources. And when you reach a point where you reach hunger and you don't have access to food, then that fat and that gets broken down to provide energy as you need. So that's the principle. The biggest problem with modern living is that we just eat and eat and eat. We don't actually eat when we're hungry. And intermittent fasting really does that. It's basically, if you're looking at fasting for a period of 12 to 14 hours, we know that in Ramadan as well, we fast for 12 to 14 hours. But about 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, you're hungry. All right? And that's a time when your body now doesn't have enough energy and starts using up the fats and the glycogen, etc. It eats up all of that to provide the energy to sustain you to the next meal as well. And that's the natural cycle that humans have, have gone through. So the principle of fasting is a very um, important one and it's actually recognized and globally a trending in the West. Yet we have Ramadan as an example that really uh, should teach us that fasting is the important principle of guidance that Allah SWT has provided for us. So I think that's the first important thing to appreciate uh, on this concept of 
weight control, uh, controlling what we eat, uh, and also trying to go through fasting states to ensure that we just eat what we really need. Uh, what's interesting is that if you look at what they, what they do often in, in Europe and other places with intermittent fasting, you need to achieve at least a minimum of 12 hours of a fasting state. So if you eat seven, supper at 7 p.m. and you have breakfast at 7 a.m., bed might you slept through the night, you did no activity. But the reality is your heart is pumping, you're breathing, the cells are alive, they're active. The amount of energy you consume even while sleeping is quite remarkable. And just scratching your breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning allows a 13 hour, hour fasting state. Uh, and that's really in, in a very sort of a resting state fasting. But in Ramadan, we know we go through the Islamic sunrise and sunset. So you actually push yourself a little bit further by making sure that you're not, uh, you, you, you have a short supply even in your daily physical activity. And I think these lessons that Allah provides, warning us against excessive eating on the one hand, and the wrath that comes through it, and the advice on fasting uh, and its importance for our, our human living. And the ayah of fasting I'd like to read to you is in Surah Baqarah. Not the ones related to Ramadan, but the one that precedes it. It says, Ya ayyul ladhina amanu, kutiba alaykum usiyamu, kama kutiba al ladhina min qablikum, lallakum tattakun. Or you believe fasting is prescribed to you, as it was prescribed to those before you, that you may learn taqwa. So there's two important highlights on this concept of fasting that's mentioned here. The first is that it's not necessarily a, a, a fasting practice that was established in the time of the Prophet and subsequent. He says, fast as it was prescribed to those before you. So even Christians, even even Hindus as well, they also fast. So fasting is not a new concept as such. And that principle of showing self-control is a universal feature. And we're just being blessed by being forced into a monthly, uh, annual month of fasting as such. So this principle of fasting is a universal one that's applied by Muslims and non-Muslims. The last part says, Allah um And we understand the word taqwa to mean righteousness, but actually taqwa really means uh, self-consciousness, awareness. Um, you know, it is that uh, light in your mind that makes you realize. And when you're looking at fasting, come four or five o'clock in the evening, you actually have taqwa because you feel like eating, but you're aware that you're fasting and you will not eat. And you'll wait and you'll control yourself, you'll, you'll apply self-control till the sunset period. And that is taqwa, that is really being able to be disciplined and self-conscious to control yourself in obedience to Allah SWT. And I think this principle of fasting really teaches the physical benefits are obviously there around weight uh, reduction, etc. But the spiritual benefits of being able to be a far more obedient servant to Allah, being conscious, being uh, internally aware, is probably the most valuable thing that fasting teaches us. The last thing I'd like to just briefly highlight is that for us as Muslims, we're very familiar with fasting. It's just become a ritual. We, we don't eat between sunrise and sunset and then we Feast after that. It's fast and feast, right? It's not fast and showing discipline. And I think the first principle there is that obviously we need to change our attitude and from adapt come forward. And also try and apply some form of self discipline before Ramadan uh, to actually develop that self consciousness as such. But the thing I'd like to highlight before I end off is that we often think of fasting from an Islamic perspective with Ramadan purely and nothing else. But it's amazing that if you go through the Qur'an, you find many examples of where fasting is recommended. And often it's recommended as a form of atonement. So, if for example there was some error in your hajj, they talk of dumb and people just like to sacrifice an animal. But the alternative is actually to fast. Fast, fast for a specific period of days. And the examples of manslaughter where uh, there's an accidental uh, death, uh, although there's uh, expiation, expiation through uh, financial means, but the other recommendation is a fast, a fast of two months, uh, where uh, there was a commitment of a crime of zihar, uh, or false divorce. Uh, expiation of fasting for two months is recommended. So, but the last one is very striking. You know, Allah advises us that uh, Allah has instructed you that when you break an oath, you should fast for three days. And I was just thinking of that one there, you know, we, we always promise things that we can never deliver, right? And if you just uh, apply the three days and you did ten, ten false 
statements in the year, we've been fasting for a month at least, right? So the principle I'd like to highlight is that fasting is a principle that's, at least self-control rather, and abstention, is an important principle that is taught as part of the principle of the Quran, part of the principle of Islam, that we need to be able to have a degree of self-control. Fasting is an excellent means to that avenue, both for physical and spiritual means as such. So just to end off, I began this talk about the issue of, of being overweight and obese. And half of South Africans are actually overweight or obese. And that's really a shocking figure in, in a continent that's uh, starving. Uh, and the issue of being able to share what we have and eat less and share more will be an important principle. And the second is that we should try and do fasting more regularly, whether we choose to do the classical fasting of sunrise and sunset, but also the concept of intermittent fasting, the principle of people before us, uh, you find Hindus having a fruit fast or there's different types of fasting. You could even choose that, you know what, you'd like to just control what you eat. So you normally have confectionery, you know, when you go to all these functions, try and limit it. That's a way of self-control, and I think we as Muslims need to really strongly develop internal discipline and self-control, and these measures are both physically beneficial, uh, but also have benefit for us as a community as well. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.